Hello. I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Thank you for your continued support and input. Both of these are crucial to our success. Next, I would like to thank the team at the University of Miami Libraries for their willingness to do this recording of their September 10th webinar presentation to the OCLC Research Library Partnership. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to my colleague in the RLP, Rebecca Bryant, who will kick things off for us. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to position this presentation you're going to hear today within a larger webinar series that's being offered to our research library partners. Um, we kicked off on August 26th with a webinar about our recent research report on cross-campus partnerships in library and university research enterprise. Uh, today you're going to hear a case study about libraries and interdisciplinary research teams, but as you can see here, it's also part of a lot broader offering that we encourage people to register for. Uh, this includes case studies, like the one you're going to hear today, from our member libraries. We're also going to be diving into and basically doing informational interviews with people working often in close partnership with the library, but from other parts of campus, such as research development and campus communications. So stay tuned for those events that are coming up soon. I'll also add um, that this is related to a recent OCLC research report published by, um, by OCLC and authored by myself and my OCLC colleagues, Annette Dortmund and Brian Lavoie. Uh, and this report is intended to better understand many of the areas that libraries are, are, are working with in research support, many of the other um, stakeholders involved with that, to sort of offer a model for understanding what they care about and who they are, and also provide some, some guidance for libraries and also for those other stakeholders about how we can be more successful in this cross-campus relationship building. So here's quickly our, our speakers today, all from uh, the University of Miami Libraries. Um, they're also going to introduce themselves as they go along. So I want to thank them all, and we can turn it over to Kelly now. Here, we are really glad to be able to uh, share our story with you today. So my name is Kelly Miller, and I'm the Associate Dean for Learning and Research Services at the University of Miami Libraries in Coral Gables, Florida. I'm delighted to be here with three colleagues from the University of Miami, Kinneret ben Kanan, Angela Clark Hughes, and James Sobzak, to report on what we've learned about the roles and contributions that librarians can make on high-impact interdisciplinary research teams. I will offer the perspective of an administrator charged with developing a collaborative relationship with the Office of Research on campus. Angela and James will describe their participation on individual teams, and Kinneret will discuss the ways that we've assessed our collaboration. We'll conclude with a time for questions and answers. So thank you for coming today. Um, in the last several decades, librarianship has been adapting to meet the changing needs of the 21st century research enterprise by building expertise in such areas as scholarly communication, data management, and digital scholarship. We believe that a new area of exploration is the role of the librarian on interdisciplinary research teams. At the University of Miami, we've had an extraordinary opportunity to explore this emerging area of librarianship thanks to the university's Laboratory for Integrative Knowledge Initiative, also known as ULINK. The goal of the strategic program is to address the world's most compelling problems through interdisciplinary inquiry. Teams of scholars from multiple disciplines receive funding to pursue solutions to complex problems. In the first three years of ULINK's existence, from January 2018 through this summer 2020, librarians have been embedded on each of the award-winning teams. This opportunity has provided librarians with direct knowledge of the needs and demands of interdisciplinary teams. The experience has allowed them to deepen their relationships with research faculty members and experiment with new ways to share their expertise and skills. Here's the vision for the ULINK program, and I will emphasize several key elements. 
The program is focused on grand challenges that require multiple disciplines to interact with one another to create solutions. And funding for research teams is provided in several phases. The first phase offers funding for teams to develop their concept while team building. And the second phase provides funds for the team to begin implementation of the proposed experiment or project. Implementation may include creating prototypes or collecting preliminary data that could help lead to external grant proposals. So ULINK team training is based on emerging scholarship in the science of team science, research on how scientists, social scientists, humanists, and others work together across disciplines to solve complex problems. An annual Science of Team Science conference is now taking place. We presented at the most recent conference in May, and the next one will take place in June 2021. The U-Link vision also includes a commitment to fostering team interaction and bonding. We created spaces in the UM libraries for teams to gather and work together. This is a picture of the faculty exploratory where U-Link teams met regularly prior to COVID-19. This aspect of the program connects with our UM library's long-term vision and planning for a future renovation of the third floor of Richter Library, our largest library, to create a research commons where faculty can meet and collaborate across the discipline. This program has funded more than a dozen interdisciplinary research teams. As a senior administrator, I served on the ULINK Action Team, a committee that was facilitated by the VP for Research. We reviewed each application to the program and advised on the program's development. This is a chart showing each of the three rounds of phase one funding between 2018 and 2020. Topics have included the ailing health of the oceans, spatial profiling, hazardous noise, and other societal problems. Faculty participants have been drawn from across the university's 11 disciplinary schools, and nearly a dozen librarians have been involved as team members. So now I'd like to hand the microphone to my librarian faculty colleagues who serve as ULINK librarians. They will provide their own perspectives on the roles they play and the contributions they've made. Angela Clark Hughes will be the first to present. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon, I'm Angela Clark Hughes, director of the Rosenstill School Library at the University of Miami. The Rosenstill School is our marine and atmospheric science graduate school and the campus is located about 40 minutes from our main campus on a barrier island called Virginia Key. But the school also has a presence on the main campus for our undergraduate program. So there is a great deal of back and forth between the campuses. As Kelly mentioned, UM launched its ULINK program in 2018. And I was assigned to two teams in the first year of the program that both had a marine science focus. But overall, I've served on four very interesting and very different research teams. I was on a team integrating oceans and human health science, which focused on the aerosolization of harmful algal blooms, a team researching coastal resilience, employing restoration strategies that combine gray cement-based and green nature-based defenses to reduce the impact of ocean waves. Recently, in the 2020 program, I was invited to join a team looking to develop integrated solutions for sustainability, uh, sustainably feeding the world using aquaculture, focusing on coastal communities directly affected by fishing declines due to overfishing, climate change, and environmental degradation. This team is in phase one right now looking to uh, apply for phase two funding, which is coming up soon. And lastly, in 2019, I was asked to be a member of this ULINK team, Hyperlocalism, Transforming the Paradigm for Climate Adaptation. And we represent atmospheric sciences, architecture, English, communication studies, marine geosciences, and information science. In our phase two, we added to our team a GIS mapping librarian and a PhD student 
who's also in communication. And the PhD student is funded through the ULINK pro program for all phase two teams. So we are a large team with a lot of research experience on a very senior level. But the difference with this team was the immediate team dynamic. The first phase of ULINK puts an emphasis on the science of team science, as Kelly mentioned, essentially building and solidifying the team before the research even begins. And while that can be very clunky with a newly assembled group of individuals from all different disciplines, we managed to organize very well. But we couldn't be truly hyper-local without working closely within the communities and with organizations that also saw a need to approach climate adaptation from a people first perspective, to bring community voices to the forefront. And to do that, we partnered with advocacy groups that are working to inform and empower individuals in the community in climate change awareness, the Clio Institute, Catalyst Miami, resilience officers from the city of Miami and Miami-Dade County. And with the team fully assembled, we explored the gaps between current policy and neighborhood interests and assessed the potential impact on a granular scale or hyperlocal scale. So our team created an integrated climate risk assessment protocol, we called ICRA, by mapping several parameters listed here that could be overlaid to determine the grade of risk in any given neighborhood. This particular map layer shows the septic systems in a city in Miami, with the majority of systems in need of repair. And we know that these systems are vulnerable to sea level rise and to heavy rain. When the sea level rises, the water table rises, which greatly affects these systems. So once we determined the risk or the areas that were most at risk, we conducted our field studies which I will say for me was the most exciting part of this team research and team building. <laughs> meeting people from different perspectives, uh, meeting the community members, um, the team had a great adventure doing this. This is our team out one day evaluating a storm drain pumping station. So essentially we would just walk neighborhoods noting the streets that were flooding, ponding on grass, housing elevation, and marking every creek and every canal and every hot spot to familiarize ourselves with the area, the social environment and the topography. Then with the help of our community partners, whose responsibility it was to solicit participants, we held a series of workshops focused on these communities. For these workshops, we developed a novel protocol for community engagement using two techniques. The first, Photo voice is a method in which participants illustrate their observations through photos of their neighborhood. They caption each of their photos and then were asked to give a brief narrative about the photo. So looking at the middle picture, a broken bus bench in the sun may not seem problematic until you meet the woman who stands there in the heat or in the rain every day on her way to work. Then that broken bus bench takes on another meaning. Then we used design thinking, which is a method to arrive at possible solutions for the next course of action for these community members. So as a member of this research team, I helped in the development, the testing and creation of the ICRA protocol. I co-facilitated the photo voice and design thinking workshops that were conducted and with the subsequent data analysis from these workshops. I am collaborating on two articles on the protocol and the results of our workshops and studies, and co-wrote the grant proposal for external funding, which we were awarded in January of this year. And because we did receive support for AT from AT&T for our um, HILO project, our team made the UM News. 
And we also created a website to maintain a touch point for all the local communities that we have engaged and that we will engage and for our community partners with the idea that this team and our research will persist beyond its final U-Link phase. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, James Albeck. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. I uh, appreciate that handover. Um, hello, everyone. My name is James Sobzak, and I am the STEM librarian at the University of Miami. And before I dive into my section of today's presentation, I just wanted to give a brief overview of my background, as I think it helps inform kind of how I approach my ULINK experiences. Um, as you can see from this slide, I am relatively new to the librarian profession, having obtained my MLIS from the University of Washington in 2018. And I'm also somewhat new to the STEM field as well. Um, my other degrees have come from the field of architecture, which I consider to be somewhat more of a STEM adjacent uh, rather than a hard science uh, subject. And finally, I am also somewhat new to the University of Miami as an institution, having taken on my position just a little uh, less than two years ago. Uh, so the point I'm really trying to get at with this slide is that I'm pretty much new to almost every aspect of my current job. And while this has given me some non-trivial bouts of imposter syndrome when I first started working on ULINK teams, I think it also kind of fostered a kind of can-do attitude on my part um, to take on roles within the library as I wasn't really burdened with any preconceived notions of quote-unquote traditional academic library roles. Uh, so currently I serve on as a ULINK librarian on two separate teams. My first team, which I joined uh, pretty much immediately upon arriving at UM, um, is interested in developing and implementing the next generation of coastal structures. Uh, this team, which is made up of faculty from the departments of civil engineering, economics, biology, architecture, and sculpture, um, is researching uh, interventions that holistically address the effects of sea level rise and storm surge mitigation, two critical issues facing global, uh, global, global coastal communities, um, but especially those communities here in South Florida. Um, this team has already gone on uh, through the first year of phase one funding and based on our preliminary research, was awarded uh, one year of phase two funding, hence the little ribbon on this image, um, which we're hoping to get renewed uh, again for this upcoming year. My second team is looking at plastics usage as part of modern material culture, and it is hoping to find ways to promote more mindful use of single-use plastics throughout their entire life cycle from production to disposal. And this team is composed of faculty from the departments of archeology, span English, chemistry, economics, marine biology, and visual communications. So both teams are very interdisciplinary. Um, so what do I, as a librarian, uh, contribute as a team member? And I underline um, the phrase team member uh, because I really do think that the UN program views librarians as full-fledged team members on these projects, not just as ancillary support staff. Uh, first and foremost, as one might expect from a librarian, I helped with some of my team's initial literature searches. And because this is interdisciplinary team science, everyone comes to the table with their own um, preferred resources, databases that they use, and research practices. So having a librarian on the team as somewhat of a neutral party kind of helped the team explore and find articles and reference materials that might not otherwise be in their uh, normal purview in their day-to-day -day research. Another service that I provided was the coordination and setup of specific library spaces in which to hold our weekly face-to-face -face meetings, thus emphasizing the role of library as a kind of collaborative hub on campus. Um, and while the space coordination might seem somewhat insignificant, I can't emphasize how important it really was to get everyone together in the same room around a whiteboard to kind of hash out the initial early ideas for the projects. Um, and while COVID has kind of rendered this server somewhat obsolete during the current moment, um, the habit of meeting weekly has actually continued on with both of these teams um, virtually into the realm of Zoom. Um, and throughout the ULINK experience, um, I also got the opportunity to contribute um, to the scholarly output of my teams. Um, this includes having to help uh, author um, articles, presentations, and even the case of my plastics as material culture team, we recently collaborated on an op-ed piece that was published in the Miami Herald, which was a really exciting development for me as this was my first time uh, directly engaging with this type of science communication to a larger, more general audience. Um, but where I really kind of excelled as an asset to my team was in the creation, documentation, and management of information objects generated by the team um, through new and emerging tools and technologies. And two really quick examples 
that come to mind are 360 video and Microsoft Teams, which I will expand upon in the next slides. Um, so because my next generation uh, of coastal structures teams needed to document the complex and dynamic environments of the coastal sites we visited on our various field trips, I had the idea of leveraging our library's Creative Studios audiovisual equipment loan program um, to introduce my U-Link team uh, to GoPro 360 degree waterproof cameras, um, which allowed the team to virtually revisit the sites later when we were back in the library and capture kind of the dynamic information in these 360 videos that's not readily available and even still images, still images no matter how many you take. Um, so not only did the use of this camera for this specific U-Link project allow my team members to kind of interact with the equipment, um, they now know that this equipment is available for them and their students outside of U-Link as well. Um, so here we have the kind of synergy between two separate library programs, U-Link and Creative Studio, each supporting the efforts of one another. Uh, the other game changer was kind of the introduction of Microsoft Teams um, to my U-Link team. And this was kind of a collaborative platform to share and communicate resources. And then having the ability to kind of informally chat, set designated channels on specific topics, store and backup information and documents in the cloud, it was just a huge productivity booster to us. And because I had suggested that we implement Teams back in 2018, well before the pandemic hit, when COVID did come to the University of Miami and we, uh, the university vigorously published and pushed the uh, adoption of Microsoft Teams um, as a campus-wide platform, all the faculty on my U-Link teams already kind of had a leg up on their colleagues as they were already familiar with this platform. And this kind of shows how the uh, early adoption of new technologies and tools can often yield kind of unexpected dividends. Uh, so, what um, did I, as a librarian personally, what did I gain from this whole ULINC experience? Uh, well, first and foremost, it was a great way to directly engage with my faculty. Um, if they can see me as a productive collaborator within these limited team settings, I think they're more likely to see me and the library in general as enthusiastic collaborators on their other research endeavors. Uh, ULINC was also a great way for me to learn about the subject areas I liaison with. Being a new librarian, um, this is kind of be a hard thing to kind of break into those uh, siloed knowledge um, bases on campus. So through the informal and formal conversations with my team members, I now have a much clearer insight into their and their respective departments' research interests. And this has allowed me to become more informed um, regarding resource allocation and kind of collective development practices. And as Kelly and uh, Angela have mentioned before, um, the uh, the ability to learn about the science of team science through Ulink was a great experience. Um, and not only could I kind of engage with kind of the ongoing research in this field, but I could actually apply that to the formation of my Ulink teams um, throughout this process. And finally, Ulink has given me the opportunity, like presentations here today, uh, to present on the contributions of academic librarians to scholarly endeavors in higher education and hopefully expand interest in similar projects um, by folks at other institutions. All that being said, um, I just want to have one final slide that I want to include because any program like ULINK, given its size and scope, is not necessarily with our fair share of kind of pitfalls and maybe shortcomings. And I hope to, and as I hope to contribute, uh, continue with my old teams and new teams in the future, or if I was to advise anyone looking to join similar interdisciplinary projects at their own institutions, I'd try and be mindful of the following points. First of all, realize that there is no one best way to be a librarian on any of these interdisciplinary science teams. What works really well for one team might be completely unworkable for another. Each team has its own unique combination of skills, expertise, and personality types. So you really need to be flexible in your role and find a niche that works best for you and your team. Uh, second, uh, sometimes you have to kind of put yourself out there and just try certain ideas and see what works and what catches on with the team. Um, sometimes it's the only way to demonstrate your skills and hidden talents as a librarian, because like it or not, most faculty members and researchers only have a very rudimentary understanding of the full extent of our skills as, li as librarians, let alone as individuals. And finally, uh, I want to emphasize that you cannot take a slow research pace or failures on your project too much to heart. Interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary science by its very nature is uh, tricky to get right. Um, failing is not going to feel great. It, it never does. Um, but try to look at it um, not as a personal reflection on your skills and talents. It's just part of the process. And just like with sports teams, not every team makes it to the championship match, and neither does every U-Link team go on to get repeat funding. Um, that's just the nature of the endeavor. And with that, I think I have um, 
spoken long enough, so I'll turn it over to Kinneret um, to talk about assistance. assessment. Thank you. Hey, thanks, James. My name is Kinneret Benkman. I'm the Research and Assessment Librarian at UM, and I'll be presenting about the assessment components in this uh, project. So this uh, opportunity has opened new avenues for our librarian to collaborate with researchers and become their partners. It has also opened the door for UM libraries to gain insight into interdisciplinary research and its challenges. This insight knowledge has informed our library renovation planning. It will guide our professional development investment and help the libraries better respond to interdisciplinary research needs in the future. In 2018 and 2019, we conducted surveys and focus groups to learn about librarians' experience on the team. We wanted to know about librarians' role, benefits to the team, challenges, and how the library can better support the librarians on these emerging roles. To examine these questions, we developed an open-ended server instrument that was distributed annually to librarians who participated in UNIT. The results of the survey accumulated from two consecutive annual activities. Six librarians participated on the 2018 survey and five participated on the 2019 survey. Results were analyzed and clustered around overlapping themes. In addition, a semi-structured focus group with 11 U-Link librarians was also conducted. We ask only several guided questions to encourage our librarians to share their ULIC experience as well as to give them the opportunity to learn about their colleagues' experience on ULIC. The focus groups led to an open and enriching dialogue that lasted around two hours. It was very, extremely valuable and it supplemented our understanding of the survey results. We found that librarians contribute to interdisciplinary research teams in diverse ways, but that their contribution clustered in three main areas. The first one, finding and accessing information resources across disciplines. The second, connecting teams to experts and resources. And the third one, improving collaboration and communication strategies. This first area is not surprising, but the second two are particularly interesting and promising. Librarians are serving as connectors as well as, as, and also serving to help the team cohere and engage more meaningfully. During the focus group, challenges and barriers to successful partnerships between librarians and research teams have surfaced. Several librarians expressed frustration about the level of inclusion on their teams. Some mentioned the need to determine clearer expectations. What is exactly the role of librarians on interdisciplinary research teams? This question does not have a general answer, of course, as each librarian comes with a different expertise and skill set. With regards to the level of inclusion, it is important to note that librarians who took part in more than one research team indicated that, that librarians' contribution also relies heavily on whether the research agenda was established. In addition, other team dynamics may influence the level of inclusion of any team member, not only the librarians. Librarians also discussed the differences between them and other team members regarding rewards, shared authorships, and grants. Should rewards be different? In most cases, we found that they were different. Lack of confidence in their own ability and skills to participate as a research team member was another issue we discussed. However, we noticed that concerns related to self-confidence faded once librarians gained more experience, basically after the first year. Lastly, we learned that leadership changes in higher administration may also influence the librarian's participation on this or other similar projects in the future, regardless of our contribution, inclusion, and value. With this finding, we were able to refine our description of the U-Link Librarians Program to educate faculty members applying to U-Link grants about the beneficial role that librarians can play on the team. On this informational sheet distributed to applicants, librarians are quoted about how they contributed to their teams by connecting their teams to community stakeholders, 
conducting extensive literature searches, and identifying and managing project collaboration software for the team. In the context of science of team science, prior research studies have examined the value of adding knowledge bridging collaborators, such as librarians, to scientific teams. One study indicated that participation of a bridge builder or a knowledge broker, such as librarians, contributed to the integration of successful teams. Librarians can serve as integration specialists. With their unique skill sets and mutual vantage points, librarians can help team address some of the most common challenges they face, including how to manage large teams, navigate difficulty communicating with team members, and find a common language with which to address the proposed problem. Another way to describe the role of librarian might be as cultural translators who are necessary for breaking down silos of all sorts, in this case, between disciplines and for the benefits of society. To you, Kelly. You the, thank you, Ken. Uh, the librarians have been called uh, pioneers by university administrators who designed the U-Link program. Dr. John Bixby, our former Vice Provost for Research, confessed in this university news story that he didn't expect the librarians to become such important U-Link partners. But he said each of them has added content expertise to the team in which he or she is embedded. And he added that the teams have reported that the librarians have become a critical aspect of their team. So next steps. What are we doing now? What's, what's on the horizon? The Office of Research just sent out a survey to the most recent set of teams, and we are looking forward to seeing the results. This survey will give us data on faculty perspectives on librarian involvement. There's also been a leadership change. The previous Vice Provost for Research retired, and the Associate Vice Provost for Research, Susan Morgan, with whom we work very closely, returned to her faculty role. Now we have a new Vice Provost for Research, Erin Kobetz, and we are in conversations with her about the next iteration of ULINK and what our collaboration might look like. Under her leadership, we are involved in a ULINK experiment to fund social equity grants in response to the nationwide call for racial justice. Librarians are serving as application reviewers for this round, and in some cases, uh, they are serving on teams when they've been written into grant proposals. Finally, we are also working on our long-term plans for renovations to the library to create a research commons. So thank you so much for being with us today, and we'd love to connect with, connect with you if you have comments or questions, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, this is Rebecca again, and I'm going to um, pose some of the questions that we, we um, heard from uh, research library partner members in the course of the live uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so, and this is going to be for whoever makes most sense on the team to respond to. So, it uh, looks like maybe the first one is for you, though, Kelly. And that is, how did the partnerships between the library and the U-Link initiative arise so that a librarian was embedded on each funded team? Oh, and also, how are librarians chosen for or assigned to any of the teams? Yes, both great questions. Thank you. And the collaboration developed uh, out of a conversation that I had with uh, Susan Morgan, the previous um, Associate Vice Provost for Research, and uh, she came to the library to share with us her plans for ULINK and uh, how the experiment was going to roll out. And in the course of the conversation, I floated the idea of uh, having librarians participate fully on as team members. And she loved the idea and said, let's do it. Uh, at that point, there wasn't much time remaining until the rollout of the first uh, grant cycle. Uh, so we moved rapidly to match librarians to appropriate teams. Um, because at that point, the teams had already uh, 
been selected. So um, that initial phase, there was just administrative decision making to figure out which librarian would be on which team. Um, in subsequent years, we adapted that approach because we found that it was helpful for the teams to be able to uh, decide which librarian they wanted to work with if they already had an existing relationship um, or kind of explore options. And also in that uh, scenario, the librarian then is invited by the team to participate. And so it created more mutuality in the relationship. So we've definitely been adapting uh, and adjusting the way that we match um, librarians to teams. So thank you for those questions. Okay. Second question we have, I think, is for Angela and James. And this is about your work as liaisons. So, so how do you, as liaisons, balance these projects with what's probably already a full-time portfolio of, uh, of work that you have? James, did you want to start? Sure, yeah, um, I can jump in. Uh, yeah, uh, so yes, it is a time commitment, definitely, uh, especially uh, with my team. We kind of, in our team charter early on, we made a commitment to at least meet uh, every week for at least an hour. Um, so again, it's that might not seem like a lot, but then on top of that, you figure there's going to be some prep work that goes into those meetings and work that, of course, comes out of those meetings. Um, but while that is a, a big commitment in the week, I feel that um, the investment in these teams um, has yielded um, way more dividends than what I've kind of put into it, just as far as um, getting knowledge about my faculty that I engage with, and this is especially useful as a young librarian. Um, so while it may seem like a, a big investment, and it is, um, I also just look at it as kind of like part of my role as a librarian and just kind of part of my daily practice and how I make myself a better and more useful uh, librarian to my faculty at my, my university. I would agree with uh, everything that Jane said and just add that being part of the team, uh, you just have to allocate time to uh, the team development, the, the relationships with team members and the team meetings, reading the literature and understanding the research. Um, all of that just comes as, as part of your other duties as assigned as a librarian. And so um, it is it is very important to manage time and to uh, just make sure that you, you have time for that, that input into the team to actually feel like you're on the team. And so a follow-up for that is how would you, Angela and James, what would you describe as the biggest challenges or barriers that you encountered with your roles? And and I'll add that this also might might be something that you also talked about, James, um, or maybe Kinneret spoke about about um, maybe a bit of imposter syndrome at the beginning as well. So any comments about that? Yeah, I think I was the one that made the uh, imposter syndrome comment. And yeah, that definitely was kind of my biggest hurdle. Um, very early on in the project, especially just joining a team about like immediately upon joining my uh, university and my role here as a librarian. Um, and I think that, yeah, there's just kind of feeling like maybe I wasn't going to be knowledgeable enough to be a contributing member to the team and just the kind of lack of confidence there. Um, but I really think I got kind of got over that pretty quickly, actually, once the team started to form and everyone realized that with interdisciplinary team science, um, no one is going to be an expert in any of these fields, and we're all kind of in the same boat together. So the more we can work towards common ends, the more everyone feels like they belong and is part of a team. And then, like I mentioned in my section, that sometimes you just kind of have to put yourself out there and try different things. And be, you'd be surprised at how many of just kind of the ideas that I had that might work for the team actually ended up kind of demonstrating that, oh, yeah, this person has something to contribute. They should be at the table just as much as any of us. So. Um, it was a little lack of confidence at first, but I think that that hurdle um, I got over pretty quickly, but it was definitely um, intimidating at first. Thanks. Anything to add, Angela? No, I, I think James hit the nail on the head. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Um, I'll move on to the next question we received, and that's probably for 
Kelly, um, but somebody asked and said, I'm curious what resources you are using or what structures you have in place to educate yourselves in order to serve as reviewers for the racial justice proposals. Uh, and this person also said, this is exciting and important work. Um, thank you. Uh, so in this case, what we did is uh, the procedure was different where librarians were actually um, named as uh, reviewers for the grants, but um, only for particular grants. So we here we did match uh, librarians with uh, relevant backgrounds to the particular proposals. So each librarian only read one or two proposals uh, that fell in their own area of expertise uh, of discipline background or expertise. So, um, so there was already preparation. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, I'll just add that all of us, I think, are um, realizing the significance and enormity of the, um, of the work that lies ahead and uh, are um, working, working to learn and educate ourselves as, as much as possible, especially those of us who are white. And um, but in this case, yeah, the, the librarians were matched with their own area of expertise. So it was nice alignment. I thought, I, I thought I'd chime in and ask a, a question. Um, I, I'd actually like to ask uh, Kelly, you're, you're on the hook again. Um, the work that you and your team have been talking about today, so this work of connection, coordination, cultural translation, and developing relationships, it's its also valuable, but can also be unseen work that's, that's hard to quantify. Um, I am glad to see that your work has been recognized on campus, but I'm curious, are there things that you are intentionally doing to help shine a light on this work and raise the visibility of its value? Um. Yes, um, we are. So the so the question there is around um, sort of compensation and value. Um, so yeah. So in terms of of how librarians are compensated, um, we view this as we view this whole experiment, the Ewing experiment, as an opportunity to uh, begin to transform librarian roles. We see this as an emerging area of librarianship, and uh, particularly as we look at the liaison model, um, this is a really emerging um, emerging area. So it's an opportunity for transformation and growth. And that being said, we see it then as part of the uh, sort of the librarian's portfolio. And we realize that's putting stresses in some cases on existing work. Uh, and so we do need to do some analysis of maybe what needs to uh, we need to let go, but uh, we we are viewing this as absolutely part of um, part of evolving roles uh, in librarianship more broadly, and it's an opportunity as well to um, show the relevance and significance of librarianship to solving uh, global challenges, grand challenges alongside our. Uh, researchers on our campuses. I think I'll just pause there. Yeah, and yeah, sorry. And, and just a quick follow-up, Kelly. We had someone mm -hmm. ask um, uh, is, um, I mean, the librarians are not, I mean, so the library, does the library receive any funding from other part of campus? Oh, um, yes, I think the, I, well, yes, thank you for the question. Um, the answer actually to that question is uh, no, we're not receiving funding to, in order to participate. Uh, we are, again, seeing this as part of our partnership uh, with the Office of Research. So we're um, working alongside them to help administer the program and really become part of the infrastructure for the program. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we are not directly receiving any any funding um, for this, but I think it's part of our uh, work to show our significance and demonstrate our potential to uh, participate uh, in this um, significant work at this time. Okay, so I think that summarizes most of the, the questions that I had. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mercy, but as I do that, I'm going to, to ask you if there's anything else that you, any of the four of you want to add today. Mm -hmm. 
No, nope. I, I think, uh, again, just I applaud all of you all for your work, for really uh, expanding um, the, the, the work of librarianship and really bringing those skills um, to to uh, strengthen the, the work of your, your team. So um, a sincere thank you to you, Kelly, Angela, James, Kinneret, um, for sharing your experiences. Um, we, and your, we learned quite a bit from you today um, and look forward to hearing more about uh, what your interdisciplinary teams are up to. Um, and so uh, 